We will have now the first speaker that I would really like to welcome, Kiki Chang. Welcome up to the stage. Kiki Chang, who is an MD, child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, former professor of psychiatry. And uh, you have been psychiatrist for two decades, haven't you? Specializing in, uh, that's a really difficult word, neuropsychiatric disorders. Ah, it went good. What do you think? I made it. And you are going to give us the one and only, I would say, definition of pants and pathos, and also give us a description of uh, the symptoms, aren't you? Absolutely. Take it away. The stage is yours. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for inviting me. Actually, I have more to say. Thank you. Um, but I don't have too much time, and I'm very aware of my time, and uh, I want to make sure that there's time for some questions and discussion. And, but it's very exciting to be here, and I think I speak for all of us, uh, as we were meeting last night, that uh, it was very, very important that we all be able to come together and discuss this very important illness that is not just in one country or two countries, but really is worldwide. And I've had the great fortune to be able to see it firsthand in the US, in Korea, in Chile, in Argentina, uh, and now in Sweden, in Estonia, in fact. So we know that it's really a worldwide phenomenon, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, my job today was to give the introduction just to set the stage uh, for much more brilliant researchers to talk about their research. So I'm going to set the stage, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, come to a consensus about what I'm about to say, but it's really more for an introduction. Many of us know these details already, but to put us all on the same page so that the rest of the conference, we can go forward and get into some more of the details and things that will lead to future discoveries and treatments. So, uh, right now I am in private practice and I was at Stanford for 20 years. And uh, as you'll see, uh, the morning is actually made up of Stanford uh, people, which is fantastic. So I'll be the first to start with our section. Uh, these are disclosures that we always give for these kind of talks, just to know that I do work with some pharmaceutical companies. They have nothing to do with pans or pandas. Uh, I also do a lot of work in the mood disorders field and work with bipolar disorders in children, okay, which I'll be talking about later this morning. Uh, I wanted to start just by pointing out something that's very local, of course, and very topical, which is this paper that came out two years ago that I'm sure most of you have seen. Uh, but what it was, was a population-based cohort study. So looking at the databases of over a million children living in Denmark. And you all have the uh, benefits out here in the Scandinavian countries of having the registries, right? We don't have those in the US, uh, and those registries are so valuable for information. And through those registries, we can uh, get great information about general population disorders. Uh, in this study, uh, it was looked at to see what the effects of having a streptococcal throat infection were with a later diagnosis of any kind of mental disorder or psychiatric disorder. Uh, and you can see here that strep throat infection was in fact uh, positively correlated with an elevated risk of mental disorders, particularly OCD and tic disorders. So over a million kids looking at this association. Non-streptococcal throat infection was also associated with increased risk, but though less than strep infection. And so, even though this is two years ago, this backs up what we've known for many, many years, particularly in the U.S., and now starting to be internationally, that streptococcus can be one of the biggest triggers of neuropsychiatric and mental illnesses in children, and later on, of course, uh, becoming adults. With that in mind, uh, one of the best well-known post-streptococcal neuropsychiatric disorders is Sydenham's chorea, and this was first described in 1686 by Thomas Sydenham, at that time describing the chorea, the chorea-like movements, okay? Uh, also, what I did not include was all the information about St. Vitus and the St. Vitus's dance. It was called that because the, uh, it was thought that if you touched a church associated with St. Vitus, that it would relieve you of all your symptoms. Um, so I wasn't sure if there were antibiotics in that church or something in, you know, maybe lithium or something in the, in the stone, I'm not sure what. But something happened, so that's why they called it St. Vitus' Dance. Um, unfortunately, we've lost that technology, we no longer use churches, but uh, we have some other treatments that I think are pretty good. It was not linked to strep at that time, or even infection, it was just noted to be a choreic 
kind of syndrome. It wasn't until the 1800s that it was first linked to rheumatic fever. Uh, by various physicians and observationists, including German and C, and finally linked to endocarditis and infection by Thomas Osler. Uh, by the end of the 1800s, Osler noted also as well that in this post-infectious chorea disorder, there was a lot of perseverative behavior. And that's where people started really recording uh, what would now become known as OCD, or obsessive compulsive behaviors, in children who had sit and chorea. Um, and there are three basic components of this. One is the emotional ability and psychiatric changes, including OCD, as well as emotional changes up and down, which we'll talk about later. Another one is neurological findings of hypotonia, and of course the third is chorea, which would be involuntary, brief, random, irregular movements of the limbs. Okay? And so that became very much synonymous with it in Korea, and became accepted in the medical world as a post-streptococcal neuropsychiatric disorder. Well, as I mentioned, uh, it became uh, noticed that OCD was found in, in a high percentage of patients with sit and chorea. And throughout the uh, uh, 1980s and 90s at the NIH, they found up to 75% of patients with sit and chorea with obsessions and compulsions. So this became more of the norm with this disorder. And then, as well in the NIH, they were studying obsessive compulsive disorder in youth. Uh, Nancy Rappaport was studying that with Sue Suido. And they started noticing that children, uh, after having strep, would also have these acute onset OCD symptoms. Okay, maybe not with chorea, but with chorea 4 movements, or with tics. And it would come on very suddenly. Um, and what they decided to call that was PANDAS, or post streptococcal sorry, uh, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection. Okay? And since then, there have been uh, many studies, uh, and, and uh, most of the animal models and some of the human models linking pandas to sitting after Korea, showing that there are biological similarities between the two diseases, and that in fact one is related to the other. So pandas was first described in 1998 by Sue Suido's group at the NIH to characterize these children who had very abrupt acute onset of OCD or motor or vocal tics. Okay? The diagnostic criteria that was proposed at that time was to have an abrupt and severe onset of the OCD symptoms and or tics. You didn't have to have both. It could be either. And it had to occur abruptly, so maximal symptom severity within 48 hours. And this would have to be following a strep infection, okay, as documented by a titer or a strep throat culture or swab. And it wasn't stated exactly how far after the strep infection that it had to be. But in addition to that, it was noted that these children also had abrupt and severe comorbid symptoms of separation anxiety, attentional deficits, and movability. It was often associated with things like enuresis and handwriting changes as well. So there's some specific somatic symptoms that were seen as well in these youth. It was known to be usually prepubertal. In fact, the criteria even said before puberty uh, down to age approximately eight to six years old. And it was known to be more in boys, but certainly a good amount of girls too, but the majority were male. And finally, typically there was a relapsing, remitting course in which you would get ill, and then they would remit and do better, and then you would get ill again. So this remitting, relapsing course over time. And that was pretty much how it was in the 1990s, in the early 2000s. I won't go over all the controversies between whether or not pandas existed or not that ensued, but there was a good period of time where research was really halted because of this so-called controversy. Um, I feel like we're preaching to the choir a little here, so we're not going to talk about controversy as much, but certainly it's still brought up in a lot of places. Things that would help to differentiate pandas from other things, such as Tourette's, uh, were the pretty clear abrupt onset of the symptoms and other kinds of somatic symptoms such as the handwriting changes. This is one of the great examples of, uh, of a patient with pandas uh, who was an excellent artist and before the infection was able to draw herself very well during the episode, not quite as well, and just pretty much a scribble, uh, but after remission being able to again draw herself, this time at the Eiffel Tower. So, and being very tall. Devil Tower as well. Okay, so that was pandas, and that happened, and it was studied over time, and there were many papers that came out of the NIH concentrating on pandas, the diagnosis as well as the uh, treatment 
And I mentioned already some of the controversy about it. Well, they were actually trying to avoid controversy. Uh, and I don't think we have any of our NIH colleagues here today, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully I'll speak for them. Uh, they noted that really it wasn't just strep that could cause these disorders. They, in fact, found many different infections, including mycoplasma, um, the flu, uh, different viruses that could set off as well these acute OCD and tick reactions. So the original name was actually Pitans. I didn't put that up there. But it was uh, post-infectious. Infectious triggered okay, neuropsychiatric disorders. So at the time, they thought maybe that was a little too broad. And they wanted to narrow it down. And they wanted to establish it. They knew it was going to be controversial, so they wanted to establish it as a very homogenous disorder. So they narrowed it down to those disorders triggered by strep only. And that's how it became pandas. But at the very beginning, they had noted that surely many different infections could cause this. Okay? So, by the 2000s, the late 2000s, the 2012 is when this paper came out, it was noted that indeed many children had the same syndrome, but no documented strep infection. But it seemed to have been caused by other things, such as mycoplasma or viruses, where sometimes there was no infection to be found at all. And so for these children, a new category that was more of an umbrella category over pandas was created, which was PANS. And that's the Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And the diagnostic criteria which were discussed among uh, people who were studying pandas and seeing these youth who were not having streptococcal infections, uh, they were noted to have acute onset of OCD or food restriction at this point, and at least two of these symptoms. Now you wonder why OCD and food restriction, right? What happened to ticks? Well, from my understanding, uh, it became, again, a desire to avoid controversy. And the ticks were, at that time, uh, thought to be part of Tourette's, and the neurologists were usually the ones treating Tourette's in the U.S. And so it was thought, okay, we'll leave that to the neurologists to go ahead and treat Tourette's and to keep the ticks out of this, and the OCD and food restriction to the psychiatrists and pediatricians. Now, that's unfortunate because I think, in reality, ticks are a very common part of the disorder still, and we know that. However, because of politics, things do change, and that's what was changed here. So it became the acute onset of OCD, and instead of ticks, we had food restriction, because there were many people noting that children were being misdiagnosed with anorexia nervosa. They were having food restriction, and the restriction was not coming as much from body dysmorphic problems, but more so from problems of fear, fear of eating, fear of swallowing, or some sort of phobic type of fear of vomiting, uh, was more often there were still children who had fear of gaining weight, but it was very atypical from your typical anorexia nervosa case. And these children also had acute onset and also had these associated symptoms. And so they were included into the, uh, the PANS uh, diagnostic criteria. So with that in mind, uh, and you'll hear more about that with Dr. Kapan speaking after me, you have to have at least uh, two of these other disorders, uh, anxiety, Emotional ability and depression, irritability and aggression, or severely oppositional behaviors, behavioral regression, uh, school performance deterioration, problems in cognition or ADHD-like symptoms, sensory or motor abnormalities, things like sensory sensitivity, misophonia, motor abnormalities such as tics or chorea or hemichorea, I should say, and finally somatic signs such as sleep disturbances, enuresis, or urinary frequency. Okay? They had to have at least two of these, and these all had to happen fairly quickly. And we had a lot of uh, interesting conversation about exactly how quickly is quick, how acute is acute. And by general consensus, it was finally thought to be up to 72 hours. So somewhere between two days and three days, really having the onset of these uh, symptoms all coming together in a very sudden way, that was very clearly a change in behavior. It was very important. And we no longer needed the association with streptococcal infection because there could be any infection associated or no infection at all. So again, this covered everything else, all other kinds of etiologies. Right? It was just a clearly a clinical syndrome that was still occurring in children. And the incidence was really unknown. Later on, it's been estimated, sorry, to be uh, approximately 1 in 200. Okay? But we really don't know the incidence. There have not been good population studies done. Uh, so we, we hope to know more about that soon. But clearly, it's something that has gained a lot more momentum in the last five years. 
and as well uh, in our observations has also gained an incidence. We don't know if that's because we've just been noticing it better, diagnosing it better, getting the word out, but for whatever reason, it does seem to be growing, at least in, in the area of the Bay Area. And the two disorders, pandas and pans, are very similar, and they share a common mechanism, and they're only differ by ideology, really. But the proposed ideology has to do with uh, infection, in this case, okay? So we'll start off with the PANDAS proposed etiology model. And in PANDAS, you have the group A, B, hemolytic strep, okay? And you have an infection of the host. And then you have a thing called molecular mimicry, in which there are proteins on the strep that look like human hosts. They're very good at hiding in humans, and that's why they've stayed alive for so long. Uh, and the human eventually recognizes the strep and makes antibodies against those surface proteins, okay? Unfortunately, after the bacteria is cleared, or, or, or soon thereafter, these antibodies are still around, and because the proteins are similar to human proteins, especially those in the brain, they will then cross-react with human brain tissue, okay? Somehow, they get across the blood-brain barrier, and they cross-react particularly with tissue in the basal ganglion, okay? Leading to a direct or indirect inflammatory response. And that's the theory, okay? It's hard to prove inflammatory response in the basal ganglia, but I'll show you just a little bit of data, brain imaging data, in regards to that. But symptom uh, symptomatically, what you see when you have a disruption in the basal ganglia is that you can see that you can get all the different symptoms that we just talked about in pans and pans. It makes sense from a neurocircuitry standpoint, right? And uh, before I was a pans person, I was a bipolar disorder researcher in children and did a lot of brain imaging studies. And so we were able to really look at different circuits in the brain and understand what was responsible for what and how they interacted with mood disorders. So similarly, in PANS, we found that the basal ganglia or the striatum were really at the center of a lot of different circuits, okay? It's really the fine-tuning area of things such as motor control, mood control, anxiety, fear response, and cognition. So it's a fine-tuning area of all of these things and you can see if you disrupt this area with inflammation, you can disrupt all of these circuits. And that can lead to things like in blue, you have the cognitive circuits here through the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and that can lead to distractibility and cognitive regression and problems with executive functioning. Okay? Uh, in green, with the anterior cingulate, uh, you see the circuit here through the striatum, through the thalamus, and that has been shown to cause obsessive compulsive symptoms when it's disrupted. Uh, you can see here the motor, here in the striatum is, a, as we know, a motor. I need to show you the prefrontal projections and, the, and, the, and then going down here to the spine. But we know that the motor circuits are through the striatum as well. When they're disrupted, you can get the motor tics there, the vocal tics. And finally, mood circuits, which I'll be talking about a little more later. Uh, orbital frontal cortex, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, going through the limbic system, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and back through the striatum. Even those circuits are regulated and fine-tuned by the basal ganglia and by the striatum. So, you knock out this, you can see how it can lead to all these different disorders, okay? So, that's the general idea. Now, in PANS, of course, if you don't have a infection, a known infection, you don't have known antibodies, you might not have this. And we're not sure then what happens here, but at some rate, the antibodies still or the inflammatory materials, which we'll hear more about later in this, uh, this conference, may cross the uh, blood-brain barrier and still lead to inflammation here, but maybe not as direct as antibody deposits or cross-reactivity or molecular mimicry. Okay, that's more of a specific PANDAS model. It may not be exactly true for all of the models of PANDAS, but we still think that the end result is very likely to be inflammation, an inflammatory disorder such as a kind of encephalitis, but a very localized encephalitis, in fact, many people will call it striatal encephalitis, okay? And so the end result is still going to be inflammation in that area of the brain. And here's the, just a little bit of data that I promised, uh, uh, looking at indirect information for inflammation in the basal ganglia. Uh, the one MRI study done with youth with pandas was done by Jay Gee now uh, almost 20 years ago. And in that study, he found that in 32 kids who had pandas versus 86 healthy kids, he did find enlarged basal ganglia volume completely. We did a study that we have not published, 
but we only, because we only had nine youth. But this, the findings were still very significant for youth with PANS versus 10 healthy controls, finding very similar things that Jay Geek found in large caudate volume. And we also found a direct correlation between the size of the caudate and the OCD symptom severity. The more severe the symptoms, the larger the caudate. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the neurons are, are more in that area. It could be a lot of different things when you see enlargement in that area. It could be support cells of the, of the nervous system. It could be fluid as well, too. Um, but for whatever reason, we do think that's correlated with inflammation. And inflammation, you do see enlargement of structures. It's interesting because in most adult studies of OCD, you see a decreased volume of caudate. And we think that over time, there is some sort of atrophy in those areas, and at least a decreased volume. So it's a very consistent finding in pediatric studies to find increase first, and then eventually with time, decreases in volume. Sydenham's Korea also with very similar findings, okay? And there was a PET study done by uh, Harry Trigani's lab at Wayne State finding increased microglial activation in caudate and lentiform nucleus. So again, this is inflammatory activity uh, in the basal ganglia in 17 youth with pandas compared to 15 healthy controls. Also in some kids with Tourette's, but they didn't have the lentiform nucleus involvement in that study. So we have some, we have some uh, uh, kind of uh, direct evidence that there is inflammation in the basal ganglia of these youth, and I'll just skip past this slide. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the presentation and the demographics, okay? So, this was a, a survey done and published in 2018 of almost 700 patients with parents or pandas. And you can see that the mean age of onset was somewhere between 6 and 10 years. The males made up about two-thirds of the survey respondents. The males had earlier onset, the females had later, and most of them reported very acute onset. Okay. Two-thirds of the time, an infection was reported as a trigger, and half the time, that infection was group A beta hemolytic strep. <coughs> and of interest in that study as well, uh, in 300 respondents, had uh, half of them flared uh, after vaccinations. So it's a question of whether or not, in some kids, could they be susceptible to immune uh, triggers to have flares of this disorder. You'll hear more about the Stanford Clinic with Dr. Uh, Tiedemann and Kapan, uh, but I want to just introduce uh, them. Uh, we started that clinic in August 2012, and at that time it was the first multidisciplinary clinic dedicated to studying this disorder, uh, being that there were psychiatrists working directly with rheumatologists in the same room, seeing the patients, learning about this, and being able to share information. It's a very powerful thing, uh, and I have to thank Dr. Franklin so much for you know, helping uh, teach me everything about rheumatology. Uh, of course, I don't remember 90% of what she taught me, but the 10% is very important. Um, and now it's currently led by Dr. Frankovich and Tiedemann, since I am now in private practice. Uh, there's a lot of collaborations there, and I can let Dr. Frankovich talk more about uh, the clinic, because uh, obviously she's more up to date with it. But the collaborations were, were fantastic, because we realized this was a disorder that affected many different systems. And we're talking about inflammation across the whole body. So it's very important to be open-minded and not be stuck in one silo and to collaborate with other people. Okay? Um, I just wanted to talk something about the course. There's not a whole lot out there about the course of illness. And so at uh, the first few years, we noticed that there were two main types of course of illness. There was one group that had that classic relapsing, remitting course that was described in kids with pandas. But we also saw a smaller percentage, about a fifth of the kids, who had more what we call a chronic static course or a slowly deteriorating course. So chronic static being that they were just not really getting a whole lot better despite treatment. They were kind of hanging in there, but still having chronic symptoms. It wasn't like they were coming down to a healthy baseline and then having a flare. They were still having symptoms. And then, of course, some children with a deteriorating course where they're never getting quite better, and in fact, slowly over time, getting worse with function. In that group, we saw that the relapse and remitting course seemed to fit a little better of the kids who were getting the acute strep infections who had it or, or had mycoplasma tinnitus. So they seemed to be more infectious, seemed to be uh, presenting with a major flare. And those who had the chronic static or deteriorating course tended to, you know, appear to approve, uh, sorry, to improve more with immunomodulatory therapy rather than antibiotics. Uh, but also improved by really eradicating strep from the household, uh, from testing everyone, swabbing everyone, and, and getting rid of carriers uh, of strep. Not getting rid of them, but getting rid of the strep. And, uh, 
Getting rid of them works too, but it's a little harder. So there was this little bit of difference, and, and, and that, that needs to be studied more, and I think that you know, forthcoming, uh, the clinic will have more information, and other places will have more information about the course, because since then, and really in the last two years, uh, I was putting together this slide thinking, it's become very international, as we talked about. And just in the last two years, this is just in the last two years, here are some of the uh, groups that have published data sets about their cases. And if I missed anyone, I'm sorry, but I tried to find the ones that had the largest clinics, not the case reports, not the smaller kinds of reports, but ones that uh, were like from uh, a bunch, of, we're talking about mostly from Italy and different parts of Italy, um, who had different uh, groups. This is a group that uh, reported on uh, the use of IVIG acutely and their successes with that and 34 kids with pandas. This is a group of 17. This is a group of 371, again, looking at long-term uh, responses to either IVIG or antibiotics and prophylaxis. Naturalistic open data for sure, but very important to start spreading the word. Uh, and here, of course, we have people here too, as well, from Gothenburg and Stockholm, who uh, will be speaking later. And they also describe their clinic population. And you can see, I just took a little bit of their demographics and you can see that in their initial reports, very similar findings, okay? Again, males slightly more than females, and age of onset around seven to eight years. So we're all finding very similar things across the globe, really, in this disorder, which is very heartening, because then we feel like we're all talking about the same thing, but also a little bit scary knowing that this is really a global epidemic. And I think it is representative, not just of one specific disorder, but this idea that inflammation can cause neuropsychiatric symptoms. And it's happening probably at an increasing rate in children than ever before. So we need to find the reasons for that. We need to find the mechanisms for that. We need to prove that to people. And we need to find better ways to treat and prevent these disorders. Okay? So I'm just going to end up now by just talking about the research consortiums that uh, we all put together back in 2013. Uh, these were 15 uh, academic researchers around the U.S. at that time. Uh, clearly, if we did it now, we would include uh, many people uh, across the Europe as well, too, and across the world. And at that time, uh, we got together to develop an expert consensus just talking about diagnostic considerations and how to work these up clinically. Not really based on any kind of empirical data, but really based on our experience and putting together the consensus uh, criteria as well as consensus how do we diagnosis in children, just to have something out there that was published to help spread the word. And then again the year after, meeting at the NIH to go ahead and talk about now consensus treatment protocols. And again, we don't have the uh, millions of placebo-controlled uh, studies that we would love to have for treatments, but we do have quite a few now that sometimes get overlooked, and we have more coming, and we need more of these kinds of gold standard studies to better talk about treatment. And I'm hoping that we get to more treatment discussion. I know we have a lot of etiology discussion. I'm hoping we get to more treatment discussion uh, later on this afternoon, tomorrow. So uh, as you probably know, these were published in the 2015 special journal of, uh, of the, the Silver Journal, which is the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology. And then two years later, uh, it was published talking about uh, the treatment recommendations, again. Uh, I broke up into three different things with antimicrobial treatments, immunomodulatory treatments, and psychiatric treatments. Okay? And Dr. Frankovich will talk to you a little more about inflammation and immunomodulatory treatments. I'm going to talk a little more about psychiatric treatments later on this morning. And uh, of course we'll be talking about microbial treatments throughout the conference as well. So in conclusion, hands and pandas, while we don't know the exact incidence or prevalence, we feel that it may be fairly common. Uh, and overlooked due to the wide spectrum of inflammatory symptom presentation, not just neuropsychiatric, but also physical presentations. And so it can be misdiagnosed very easily and confused for other disorders. The acute onset is what really differentiates these disorders from things like Tourette's, like garden variety OCD, like transient tick disorder, okay? That's the acute onset. But we realize that some youth who also meet all the other criteria may have subacute onset may happen over two to three weeks, and technically does not meet the firm criteria of pans or pandas. But a lot of those youth may look very similar or respond the same way, okay? The problem with that is in research clinics, it's hard to put those people together with the acute onset because you may be mixing different etiologies together. And that's what had happened in the past, and that led to some null findings from some studies. 
So we're trying to avoid that. So a lot of the research is based on just the firm criteria, but in the real world, we realize that there is a spectrum. And there are some youth who exist on that spectrum. Once you get out to longer and longer onset, it's harder to tell whether or not this is something else, or this is pans or pandas. Okay? And you must know that also, this is a very comorbid disorder. This is a disorder in which all these things come together, as we showed you by the brain imaging slides. Okay? That comorbidity is the norm, not the exception. And then finally, international cohorts are showing similarities across the board, which is wonderful. So we're very excited about that. So, thank you very much. I hope that introduction was neat. for this the definition of very interesting and uh, actually I'm not supposed to uh, put some questions to you now okay. since you are coming back but I will read anyway. <laughs> uh, first of all I would like to know should we uh, during this conference address uh, the disorder as pants or pandas or both pants and pandas? What do you say? That's a great question. Uh, I'm not the uh, definitive person. I think we should call it uh, Strainoencephalitis is what I think we should call it. Okay. But uh, I think, right? <laughs> but uh, I think for the purposes, I think most people have been calling it pans and pandas. So pans and pandas. I think that's fine. That's pretty good. I was, uh, and, and one more question. Uh, I was uh, a little bit uh, worried when you talked about this is epidemic and uh, that we will see more and more of this of these disorders and uh, what do you think then are the knowledge is the knowledge enough spread by at doctors I mean, in primary care for example right we have no data that this is an epidemic no. it's more of my alarmist yeah. tendency yeah. to try to get the world to see this. Uh, but i truly believe it is and uh, without any data to back me up i do think it's the tip of the iceberg when you see the uh, rising okay. in uh, autism it's been clearly documented and rising incidence in depression is clearly documented. So we do know that neuropsychiatric disorders are rising in the population. And I do believe there's a crossover between that and inflammatory disorders that may be at the root of this. It's hard to prove, but I think spreading the word is exactly what we need to do and get more people interested in involved. Thank you very much, Thank you. I have a lot of more questions, but we'll take them later. Thank you.